I have some um, great people who are going to join me, including, <clears throat> including one of the staff people from the Southern California Association of Governments, who will give it to you from the staff perspective. And, um, and so I hope you'll join us for further discussion on that issue. Uh, right now we have a couple of questions. What, what did, we, did we lose our, our two guys from? Uh... I think one of them had Okay, great. Well, the first question then is for, for you, John. Is it likely that Congress will do anything effective to respond to peak oil before shortages cause social disintegration? <laughs> This one? <clears throat> Maybe. <laughs> um, <clears throat> a lot actually depends on what you folks do. Um, in order to have Congress do anything, you have to have a sense from the perspective of Congress that the constituents are demanding they do something. So that's what I said your homework is to go out and talk to your local representative with a group of people because you don't want to look like a nut. And the other thing you can also do, which is very effective, um, write to the largest paper you can find and also the small local paper, um, a letter to the editor, especially if you've already met with your representative um, <clears throat> and, and mention that you met with them. and. Um, so you would then have their name in that letter to the editor. And this has a magical effect. That letter will have been read by thousands of people. And it's not likely that the staff will let that go by without the member being aware of this letter being in the paper. Um, this is as good as having an article in the paper. So if you want to be persuasive, um, first try to make contact. If you can find people who know the congressperson, if you find neighbors or members of the same church, you're going to multiply your effectiveness. Um, <clears throat> so the question was, uh, <clears throat> will Congress do anything effective to respond to peak oil before uh, shortages cause social dis disintegration? Well, the last part is uh, probably the worst, worst case scenario. The fear is that uh, things will fall apart. Well, then there's another task you have is to go to your local <clears throat> elected officials or become one and um, work on contingency planning because social disintegration is something that will happen if we do this sort of uh, survival of the fittest mentality. We, we, however, societies exist because people have learned to cooperate. And if you can establish connections, make make uh, plans with your neighbors, et cetera. That's the kind of thing which um, will help us get through the, the roughest times. I suspect that we're gonna see one or another form of energy disruption in the not too distant future. And that will be what I would call a teachable moment. And if you're prepared and you have already made contacts with people, you can say, see, that's what I was talking about. Okay, thank you. I have uh, three questions on the next subject, and I find it's something that comes up repeatedly, not just um, from constituents, but from myself as well. And it has to do with population and basically carrying capacity. And so if, um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick this one to ask it. Don't we have a systemic problem of overpopulation of our nation's cities? Shouldn't we be planning for a more rural, for more rural sprawl? <laughs> I'll let the senator take that one first. Well, I live in a very populated area, the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and Northern Virginia has grown uh, a lot in its population recently, and uh, we have almost full employment in the area, and I at least half jokingly, or maybe not so jokingly, said that I thought we needed to abolish the Fairfax County Department of Economic Development because we were trying so hard to bring more jobs to the area without people to fill them, which was going to bring more people in without the housing available or the road capacity or the transportation system available to handle it. So it is something that we're, we're very well aware of. Uh, my own county of Arlington 
uh, has a relationship with Martinsville, Virginia, which is an area with a, a lot of unemployment. And we are trying to work with our, some of our businesses in Arlington to see if some of their work can't be done for their firms uh, long distance from Martinsville uh, to the benefit, we think, of all. Uh, we do uh, also have a lot of transit-oriented development in Arlington. Uh, when the metro system came through Arlington, we made a deliberate um, decision to have it go through our aging commercial corridor, use it as a catalyst for redevelopment, and then uh, have both residences and housing in high density uh, with uh, convenient retail uh, all around our metro stations. And that's been very successful, uh, although it's only a part of our county. Well, I'm gonna address it um, head on because I, I love this topic. Um, and it's not that elected officials aren't aware that population and the, and the pressures that it puts on all of us um, are significant. If you want to see someone deauthorized faster than anything, then you'll talk about population. Mm -hmm. uh, I, even when elected officials are together in a room, um, you know, there's this collective nod, yes, uh, but there's not the belief that anything can be done about it politically or otherwise. And it is, I find it really interesting that we have this idea that we can grow forever, that, you know, that trees grow to the sky and that there aren't implications from the consumption, especially with Americans when we consume so much. Um, but this is going to be one of those issues that, ha it, if it's going to be addressed, it's going to have to be from the ground up. It's not going to come from the top down. And uh, so I, I guess that's, uh, do, you, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'd like to just um, point out that there are two things commingled there. One is the uh, issue of population, which clearly uh, one way or another is going to decline in some time in the not too distant future. Uh, the second is whether the solution involves spreading out the density of population that we see in cities. Uh, cities actually have a lot of virtues. The old system we used to have, which was before we had cheap energy, was a concentrated city and then rural land around it which supply the food and resources needed in the city. Uh, New York City, and I'm afraid I don't remember the exact statistic, but it's something like is eight times more efficient per capita than living in our suburban, suburban environment. And, and a lot of people also are not aware that uh, every number of years, I think it's five years, we, are, we have to do this regional housing needs assessment. We're mandated by the state to do that. And then numbers are allocated to different cities on how many new houses they have to build. And it's not a choice. We're mandated to do that. Um, so it's, 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 it's important to understand the restraints that local government especially has to work within with regards to a lot of those issues. Okay, a lot of the questions were really were toward uh, the commissioner, and uh, <laughs> it's probably fortunate she's not here. <laughs> okay, but here's one we can, we can deal with. Uh, how can politicos be convinced that conservation and raising taxes to promote conservation are not dirty words or concepts? Well, I think that most people give at least lip service to conservation. I, I don't think it in and of itself, people think that that's a bad thing. It just may not apply to them and their particular life still, but in, in general, they're sort of in favor of conservation. Um, raising funds to deal with it is the eternal question for people in public office. How, how do you balance um, the various needs of your constituents with the um, willingness or unwillingness to pay the bill and that applies to everything we do. I mean, obviously public schools is the largest of those, and I think in every state and locality, uh, it's gonna be public education that is gonna be the largest single expense. Uh, so the funds that it would take to do something for conservation or energy efficiency are actually small in comparison uh, to many of the needs that uh, a state or a locality is trying to fund, and it's, it's the eternal balance. I'm, we work at it all the time. Do you want to comment? <clears throat> well, this is like the political third rail, isn't it? Um, the, the issue of taxes is an interesting one because 
if you have a tax, then you can have a tax credit. And tax credits can be a very effective policy tool. Uh, in fact, if you are going to try to make use of uh, the collective purchasing power, if you will, of, of the, um, the tax base provides, um, using the tax credit tool allows the most efficient use of those funds because the person who otherwise would have put the money into the coffers is actually doing the thing directly uh, without any administrative cost. So um, I think you could make that argument to elected officials and make a little headway. Uh, the, the idea if you have a, um, a imposition of a tax, <coughs> a tax, you immediately offer the opportunity to get out of paying the tax by the tax credit. And people, I think, like that. Well, I'm, Go ahead. I would just say that the retiring chairman of the Senate Finance Committee in Virginia was very much opposed to a lot of tax credits, feeling that Virginia had overdone the tax credits. And what that does is take it out of the control of the budget making committee so that it, the tax credits lead a life of their own. They may be more utilized or less utilized than you anticipated. In his view, more likely to be more utilized. And therefore, when you're making difficult decisions about whether you should spend more money on health care or education or whatever, over here are these tax credits that may not be, in this day and age, in the year in which you're making those decisions, necessarily what you would do. Um, they tend to lead a life of their own. So if you want to really balance every year the most important needs in your state or your locality, then you don't want to do a lot of tax credits. I guess I would, uh, I would reword this question. Um, it's not how can politicos be convinced, it's how can the public be convinced. Uh, you know, if you, if you look back, if you can think back to that chart I showed about per capita, world per capita energy consumption it, and the, the dramatic growth in the last several years, I mean, those weren't just politicians. <laughs> those were a lot of people uh, consuming a lot more. So. Uh, I, I'm not sure how you motivate people, but I also think back to that slide I showed you about the air quality and, and the fact that it's in the, um, that the public is interested about that subject. What I forgot to tell you was that in the last two weeks, the LA Times has had 10 stories on air quality in, in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. That's what gets people's attention. So it's that repeated barrage. It's just like marketing. You have to just deluge people with this message that it's urgent and that they have to be part of the solution. And I'm also a believer that you, you tax what you want less of and you incentivize or you subsidize what you want more of. So I would certainly support that and probably be gratefully deauthorized. Uh, OK, let's see. Um, here was, this was a question for John, but I think that um, you might be able to, to address this as well. Did you consider the potential indirect impact of your own progressive planning? For example, the Portland area could tend to become a magnet for folks displaced from other areas that have not prepared as well as Portland. This dynamic could be very significant, you know, significant and disruptive. I think you would hope that what you do is lead, that Portland will have led by example and inspire many other cities and communities to do what they have done. Um, I certainly have uh, found it inspiring to know what they have done and how well they have planned uh, and the fact that they involved the whole community in, in their task force and deliberations, I, I think is inspiring to other cities and, and counties around the, the country. And I hope that we will emulate them. I, don't, I can't believe that Portland is the only city uh, in the country that's going to do good things like that. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting one. Do you see a risk to democracy as a form of government in a post-peak oil world? I think there's a risk to democracy as we speak. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we're actually seeing the first symptoms of the post-peak oil world. Uh, someone was commenting that the real problem isn't the geology, the underground limitations, the problem is the above-ground 
limitations on supply. And I would answer that by saying that the problem we're seeing on the above ground issues is directly related to the limitations of the geology. Uh, the fact is there are only certain spots in the world where you can find oil and quantities that make it worth fighting over, which is what we're seeing. So um, yes, uh, I think any place uh, that has a, um, an abundance of that resource is a grave risk at the moment, and that democracy is likely to suffer. Um, and um, I think we need to be vigilant uh, in this country um, if we want to hold ourselves up as an example of democracy, that we have responsibilities as citizens to make sure that our government acts in a way that is to our liking. And it's acting in our name in a way to, us, to our liking. So um, if we subordinate um, those kinds of things to our feelings of need for security and uh, keeping that, um, keeping the gas in the gas tank, um, yeah, there's a risk. Any, you want to comment? No? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm I, you not know, elected. <laughs> I'll say that I, I don't think you can change culture that qu quickly. I don't think that kind of a crisis, I think it'll actually make, perhaps make us function better because we will actually know our neighbors, we'll be more in tune with, or with our communities, um, and so I, I don't, I'm not as dis despondent as many people here. I actually, I get a, a real high out of coming to conferences like this and meeting such incredible people. And I've got to believe that this is a sampling of what America has, that everyone can rise to the occasion. And we will have leaders who rise to the occasion. And I don't mean elected officials, I mean leaders who create that vision and, and, and compel people to want to follow them. I mean, every time I, every time I hear Randy Udall speak, I want to you know, nominate him for president because that's the kind of message that we have to hear. <laughs> Debbie, you didn't um, spark a memory that I would just uh, mention that uh, on 9-11, we all remember the terrible tragedy at the World Trade Center, but the other attack that day was on the Pentagon, which is in my district in, um, in Arlington. But one of the things that has grown out of that in our community is that we have talked a lot about emergency preparedness, and there has been a community-wide effort to train people to become uh, persons who would be leaders if there were a community emergency. Uh, it's been operated through our civic association and civic federation network in the community. A lot of people have been involved in that, and their mission is to help look after others in their community uh, should there be an emergency. I would hope that that would be the kind of reaction we would have as we face um, the, the kind of emergencies that may emerge with, with peak oil. Thank you. Okay, a question for John. Somebody found him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, Portland's Peak Oil Task Force offers an impressive and somewhat hopeful approach. Given a deficit in federal leadership, do you plan to reach out more broadly to state and local leaders to leverage your impressive efforts? Um, <clears throat> there's a role for everybody in this. Um, clearly, a lot has to happen at the local level. One of Get, get close well, to the closer. right. Yeah, closer. There you go. Yeah, you got Does that it. work? Yeah. Um, it has to happen at all levels. It's not just the federal level. It's not just the state level. It's not the local level. It has to happen at all levels. <clears throat> at the uh, Portland task force, we were limited. I mean, quite frankly, the, the city of Portland was limited. They looked at what they could do and they said, "Yeah, we can do a lot, but there's things we can't do. State needs to step in and do certain things regarding, you know, land use policies, agricultural policies. That's not going to be affected by the city of Portland." Um, and con conversely, there's also things that need to happen at the federal level. It can't just happen at the local level, but it can't happen only at the federal level either. There's a role for everybody. As I was telling someone earlier, there are certain communities that we can point to or we can use to, um, to try to model uh, for activities, and then there are other communities we can't. In the LA area, I can't use San Francisco. Um, and, uh, and in San Francisco, they can't use Los Angeles. So it's, uh, I don't, it's an interesting little turf war, but uh, 
Portland, uh, you know, kind of falls in that range for a lot of cities. They, they can't use Portland, but they can use Seattle. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, John, here's a question for you. How many of the 535 congressmen and women are aware of peak oil but ignoring it, and how many are simply unaware? Uh, we have a peak oil caucus that has, um, I think, over 15 members now. Um, I personally was asked by the congressman, and I did spend several weeks hand carrying a large poster, The Age of Oil, and a small book uh, called The End of Fossil Energy by John Howe to every office in the House and Senate, having identified ahead of time the staff person responsible for the energy issues in that office. And I spent a few minutes with each of them. Occasionally, I actually handed it directly to a member of Congress or senator. Um, so you can't say they haven't been led to the water. <laughs> um, the congressman has given over 30 speeches on the floor of the House. Um, a number of members have come up to him, not having joined the Peak Oil Caucus, but having obviously watched his talks and, and are, are aware. Uh, I think that there is a, a gap here between um, people's um, knowledge and their kind of, it hasn't sunk in emotionally what the implications are. Um, most, of the, most of the Congress is right now focused on finding more of something to fill the gap. And you may have heard the Congressman speak here a couple of years ago where he pointed out that it really is not the challenge. The it's, Im it's impossible, ultimately, to keep up with exponential growth in consumption. And that's the challenge. We have to figure out how to eventually get to a steady state economy, get off the growth kick. This is not welcome news to most people, and they don't get it, for the most part. And what about in the Virginia State Senate? How many, <laughs> how many get it? Not very many. I make uh, periodic speeches on the floor of the Senate, and they're all rather fond of me, and they nod nicely, but it doesn't seem to, to really sink in. Um, now, I will say that our congressman is a member of the Peak Oil Caucus, and that's because Tom and I hounded him and <laughs> talked to him about it every time we saw him until he paid attention, uh, more or less got it, and joined the Peak Oil Caucus. So I do think that there's something to be said for that, that personal effort. You have to we expect to see lots more uh, congressmen coming forward to join the Peak Oil Caucus after you go home. Yeah. You have to develop a, or find a learning strategy that will help get this message to those elected officials. In Southern California, working with uh, SCAG, the Southern California Association of Governments, we, we stole quite a few people we had heard speak at in Denver and put on our own little one-day forum and that's really a great way, if you can get a, an agency, some kind of an official agency to sponsor this kind of uh, thing and put on a, con a, a conference. And ASPA is more than happy to help you get the speakers you need in your area. That can be a really effective way of turning the tides, and I think that's what turned the tides in our region and, and got more interest in this topic. Did you want to add anything, John, about poor? OK. Um, Peak oil is a long-term issue which needs to be addressed now, but shouldn't we be picking the, shouldn't we be picking the low-hanging fruit while we still can? Why are we not lining up to sign agreements with Kurdistan government, like Hunt Oil, while it's still available to us, the U.S.? Are you nuts? <laughs> I don't, I, uh, I mean, that I mean, would be. You know, if we have time and if there are short term supplies that we can get or other resources we can develop, certainly, you know, we can probably do that. But one of the worst things we can do is bury our head in the sand and plow on for another 30 years like we've plowed on for the last 30 years. We didn't take the, what happened in the 1970s as our wake up call. I mean, we need to get busy and do this stuff. It takes a while to get you know, the infrastructure in place, whether it be light rail, whether it be um, land use policies, whether it be denser urban patterns, that stuff doesn't turn around. It's like turning a freighter. You know, it, it happens slowly, and we need to start that stuff now. And if we can get some supplies from Kurdistan or something to buy us a little bit of time so that we can develop that stuff, great. But we can't do it at the expense of that. 
Key word, buying time. Which is the most effective way to buy time? Find a little more or use a little less? <laughs> okay, using Thanks. a little less leaves that that you might have used up if you found a little more for later. That's why a congressman is adamant that he won't vote for drilling in Anwar and offshore. Right. What happens when we use that up? Where are we then? Yeah, I, I really like Congressman Bar uh, Congressman's Bartlett's comment about not filling the gap. Uh, there's a professor, Dave Rutledge, who suggests that we need to have, just like we have national forest reserves, we need to have the same thing for fuels so that future generations will have something and, and, and deal with it now because we just keep put, piling more and more onto future generations. We, we, need, we need to develop an Apollo program or Manhattan Project for renewable energy and land use patterns and light rail. We need to get on crash programs and that stuff. Um, I'm going to read this question, but she's not here. I just thought it was a great question for, for Con Commissioner Jones. Is Texas self-sufficient in fertilizer? <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which kind? That's great. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we have time for one more. Um, Last question. Uh, Al Gore is the champion of the global warming climate change movement. Don't we need a celebrity to serve as the champion of the peak oil movement? This <laughs> says perhaps Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> Any, anybody anybody want to tackle that? <laughs> well, I will. <laughs> I think it. absolutely we do. Um, we need some high profile people. To, uh, to work on this, and I don't know who it is. I would take anybody at this point, Bill O'Reilly or anyone else, but, uh, okay, John? Um, co the Congressman has been subtly working on a former Texan. <clears throat> um, he met with him for uh, at least half an hour and went over everything that he goes over in his talks, and at the end of it, he had a little uh, three-line um, page which said, um, um, Kennedy and the moon, Nixon and China, George W. Question, and question mark. And he said, you know, that could be energy, that could be your legacy. It would be a lot better than Iraq, wouldn't it? Well, I, I will end it there, and thank you so much for your attention.